So it's be a very clinical perspective. I'm a sexual health and HIV physician from London. And as Jonathan said, I'm going to be talking about long-acting HIV drugs for prevention. So I'm going to cover, firstly, of course, the importance of adherence for pre-exposure prophylaxis. I'm going to talk particularly about vaginal rings and injectables, and then touch very briefly on some of the future strategies for drug delivery. So firstly, adherence. We all know that adherence is crucial for efficacy. We know that for HIV treatment. We also particularly know that for pre-exposure prophylaxis. And in the studies of oral pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, we learned firstly that self-report often does not equate with more objective measures of adherence, but we also learned that efficacy really does tail off as adherence declines. So this is taken from a plenary given at IAS last year, and we see that really for best protection for women and men, you need to be taking pills every day, i.e. seven pills a week of daily prep. If that drops to four, we can see protection really dropping for women, however, protection being maintained in MSM for anal exposure, but dropping down to just two pills a week, the efficacy in women pretty much disappears, although it is maintained to a reasonable level in men, which is why intermittent oral prep is a very efficacious option for people whose risk factor is anal sex. Now, in trials, as I've already mentioned, we learned a lot, particularly from the earlier oral PrEP trials, that adherence to visits does not equal adherence to medication. There's been a number of qualitative studies looking at why people reported taking meds when, in fact, they weren't. And many studies have shown that reported adherence is much greater than the reality, particularly when based on therapeutic drug monitoring. Now, we know, and we've heard from the previous talk in terms of antiretroviral treatment, that injectables, the trials, are associated with very high adherence because if somebody has an injection, they are adherent. And vaginal rings are starting to look a little bit more like oral tablets, which I will touch on in the next section. So, vaginal rings. Dapivirin, the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, is the most advanced, and there are two phase three randomized controlled trials looking at dapivirin ring administered monthly compared to placebo intravaginal ring. The first is Aspire in more than 2,600 women, and it showed a 27% reduction in new HIV acquisitions compared to the placebo arm. If, however, the analysis was restricted to older women with better adherence, that efficacy improved to 56%. And indeed, amongst women aged 21 or less, there was no difference between dapivirin and placebo because of low levels of adherence. The RING study was a similar study recruiting almost 2,000 women, and here they showed a 31% lower acquisition of HIV in women receiving the dapivirin ring compared to those on placebo. There was some NNRTI resistance, so one of the troubles with using antiretrovirals for prevention, of course, is if somebody acquires HIV while on that drug, there's a risk of resistance emergence. However, the resistance to non-nucleosides was similar in the two arms, and serious adverse events were more common in the active ring arms, though there was no particular pattern in terms of their nature. However, this is where we learned that adherence is not just an issue with pills. So going back to Aspire, there's an analysis of the 1,211 women who are on active product. And although there was a fairly reasonable correlation between reported adherence and drug level, and that's measuring both drug level in the female genital tract, but also looking at the discarded rings and measuring the amount of drug left in the ring, because if they haven't been in the vagina, the drug levels are going to be higher. And what they showed, actually, not surprisingly, PK non-adherence was greater than self-report, but actually 11% of the younger women and 7% of the older women who rated their ability to keep the ring inserted as good, very good, or excellent were completely non-adherent by PK measures. So again, really quite high proportions of women reporting good adherence, but with PK suggesting no adherence at all. Since then, there's been two open-label studies of the dapavirin ring, which were presented at Croy last year. DREAM, which was a ring rollover, actually showing that concentrations here are slightly better. So we've seen this with some of the oral trials, that once equipoise is lost, once people are confident the product works, adherence tends to improve. And HOPE, which was an Aspire rollover, and both of these showed a 50 to 60% 
reduction in HIV incidence compared to anticipated. The caveat here, of course, being there was no placebo arm, but based on predicted HIV acquisition rate of 50 to 60 percent reduction with adapivirin ring. Both completed early this year, and final results of these two studies are expected in the summer. In terms of other rings, there are some tenofovir ring studies. The animal studies look promising, and certainly there's one study showing good pharmacokinetics, but did show slight to moderate increase in inflammatory infiltrates. Let that be a warning, because a phase one tenofovir intravaginal ring study was stopped early when fewer than half of the planned women had been recruited. And that's because eight of the 12 women in the tenofovir arm had grade one vaginal ulceration. There was no ulceration in the placebo arm, and this ulceration, not surprisingly, was associated with higher levels of inflammatory markers. There is an ongoing tenofovir ring study compared to placebo MTN038, and results for that are anticipated next year. And one of the very important things we've learned about topical PrEP is the impact of vaginal flora. When we look at the topical studies of tenofovir gel, women with vaginal dis biosis or a bacterial vaginosis type vaginal flora had lower concentrations of tenofovir both, both intravaginally and plasma and this correlated with reduced efficacy. So women with a so-called healthy lactobacillus dominant vaginal flora saw higher levels and higher efficacy of tenofovir gel. We know from oral PrEP studies there is no impact of vaginal dysbiosis on oral PrEP efficacy. And for the dapivirin ring, there is no impact of vaginal flora on dapivirin concentrations or efficacy. So it's a topical tenofovir issue at the moment. In terms of future, there are lots of combined ring preparations being discussed. Some of them are being studied. And indeed, patient preference studies show women would prefer products that combine contraception as well as HIV prevention. There is a TDF and FTC ring that's uh, looking at two antiretrovirals, which may yield better efficacy, and that's got some promising results in macaques. And then there's a phase 2A study in Kenya ongoing at the moment, estimated to complete this summer. And that's looking at tenofovir alone for HIV prevention, compared with tenofovir and levonorgestrel for combined contraceptive efficacy compared to a placebo ring. But what we don't know is whether tenofovir concentrations from the rings will be impacted by vaginal flora. There's been no work that I could find reporting on that yet. But interestingly, Nuva ring, which is a combined etanogestrel and ethanol estradiol contraceptive ring, actually improves, as it were, the vaginal flora in women with a high prevalence of BV. So women given this contraceptive ring, you see a shift towards a lactobacillus dominant vaginal flora. So is it possible that even if ring tenofovir is affected by vaginal flora, if it's combined with the contraception, will that somehow negate some of the impact that could affect the efficacy of PrEP? Practical challenges, I think it's really far too early to know. Clearly, we've learned adherence can still be an issue. The concerns about safety and the impact of vaginal flora on NRTI-containing rings, although to emphasize dapivirin was not affected. There's also the impact of topical PrEP on genital tract immunity. And in fact, dapivirin hydrogel affects some of the markers of vaginal innate immunity. So as a study looking at dapivirin gel compared to film, you didn't see this effect with the film, you did with the gel. And I think there's an awful lot to learn about not just the drugs that we're using, but the way that they are delivered and the vehicles that we use. So I think when it comes to intravaginal prep, there's at least three crucial factors to think about. The drug itself, the route through which it's administered, and also the impact of vaginal flora. Moving on to injectables, so in terms of efficacy, as I'm sure you're all aware, intramuscular real pivirine was discontinued in 2017 due to inadequate female genital tract PK and explant HIV suppression. Intramuscular cabotegravir, there are two phase two studies that have been published, Eclair in men who have sex with men and transgender women, and HPTN 077 in men and women. And there are two phase three intramuscular cab studies, HPTN 083 and 084 in MSM and transgender women, and in cis women, respectively. 
Now, HPTN 077, I won't go into any great detail here, but this was a study in a low-risk population looking at safety and pharmacokinetics, and what it taught us is an eight-weekly injection, not 12-weekly. Eight-weekly was the one that met the PK targets for men and women. It wasn't an efficacy study because it was a low-risk population. Apologies, that is the wrong side, but there was one HIV acquisition in the cabotegravir arm, but it was at a time point when there were no detectable cabotegravir levels. Eclair was a 12-weekly IM cabotegravir study. It confirmed the findings of HPTN 077 that 12-weekly is not good enough. And these have shaped HPTN 083 and 084. These are the phase three intramuscular CAB studies with oral lead-in phases, 083, as I've mentioned before, in MSM and transgender women, and 084 in cis women, and they're expected to report in 2021 and 2022, respectively. What do people prefer? This is data from 077, and not surprisingly, people in an injectable study greatly preferred injectable PrEP. We've seen that in the treatment studies as well. When you look at, there's been a multitude of patient preference studies, most of them are discrete choice studies, and by, across the board, efficacy is the most important factor. When we're looking at different options of routes of administration, not surprisingly, most people prefer non-oral administration. They particularly like the idea of injectables. And as I've mentioned already, women like the idea of vaginal rings if they are multi-purpose. The problem with these discrete choice experiments is they are based on sometimes real, but often estimated attributes related to efficacy, tolerability, and safety. And often those may not be known until the completion of larger studies. But one quite interesting study was TRIO, which took 277 women who were all randomized to receive placebo PrEP. So they got monthly placebo ring, monthly placebo IM injection, or monthly placebo, daily placebo tablet for a month. And then after that month, they could choose whichever option they preferred. Now, most preferred any of these types of PrEP over condoms, again, not surprisingly. And again, not surprisingly, two thirds chose injection for the next phase of the study and adherence was highest for injection. So this kind of teaches us, at least in the short term, what this group of people preferred. One of the real concerns, though, I think, with injectable PrEP and also with treatment is the pharmacokinetic tail. This is data from Eclair showing that cabotegravir persists in 17% of people out to 52 weeks after the last injection. Now, whether that's enough drug to drive resistance, I don't think we know, but it's going to hang around for a long time, and it may hang around for an unpredictably long time. So what are the unanswered questions? Again, we've touched on this with treatment. What will happen with delayed or missed doses? How are we going to cover that PK tail? What with? Are we going to use TDM to guide us? Are people stopping intramuscular cabotegravir? Going to need monthly cabotegravir levels before we can stop the PK cover? The real-life acceptability of long-term intramuscular injections is one that I remain slightly sceptical about. I think the impact of BMI, the extremes of BMI in people with very low or very high body mass index, the impact of additional intramuscular injections is probably a very theoretical concern, but when you're looking at a high-risk population receiving IM keftriaxone or benzathine for gonorrhea and syphilis, I don't think we really know about the PK of adding IM injections on top of each other. And as a pessimistic Brit, the practicalities and the costs of service delivery for clinician-provided injectable prevention, I think, remains to be understood. So moving on to the future, um, I was interested to find there is a journal of controlled release, which is a new one on me. That's their logo at the bottom. But in there is a good review of the Rilpivirine dissolving microarray patches. I know you've been hearing about patches this morning. These are described as self-limiting. Um, although the release may be self-limiting, the PK of Rilpivirine may not be. So I think also there may be issues related to tail. And will the patch size be practical? I saw this morning there were discussions about a 12 by 12 centimeter patch. Uh, is, is that in itself practical? And if it needs to be bigger, I think we're entering the realms of perhaps not entirely acceptable. Implants, loads and loads of preclinical work. In terms of PrEP, there is tenofovir, alafenamide, and cabotegravir under study, and there is the option for multi-purpose implants. One example is a macaque study looking at an implant combining TAF and FTC. This offers sustained delivery for at least 83 days, yielding preventative tenofovir levels within three days, and it's refillable transcutaneously, which is new to me. My main experience is with contraceptive implants, which have to be removed and replaced. So the 
idea of refilling an implant transcutaneously, I think, is an attractive one. However, there's a lot of scepticism about this, and this is quite an interesting study to prove to you that I'm not the only pessimist in the world more than anything else. But this is a qualitative analysis of South African doctors and nurses looking at some of their fears and concerns around the use of implants for prevention. So for people interested in the rollout, I think that's an interesting read. Finally, broadly neutralizing antibodies very much outside of my area of knowledge, but we have seen some promising PrEP efficacy in animal studies. At Croy, we saw efficacy for penile exposure, having already seen efficacy for rectal and vaginal exposure uh, in animal studies. But this risk of resistance with monotherapy combinations are going to be crucial, and how we are realistically going to use these currently likely very expensive options for prevention, I think it's way too early to say. So to conclude, I have some concerns. This is not an exhaustive list. I think firstly is safety in pregnancy. We still do not yet know the outcome of the large trial in Botswana looking at the impact of dolutegravir at conception on pregnancy outcomes. Cabotegravir is a very similar drug. I think we need to understand more about the safety of this and other PrEP agents in pregnancy. Drug-drug interactions are still going to be an issue. For example, at Croy this year, we saw the modelled impact of rifampicin on cabotegravir concentrations. And also, some of these topical methods, you still see systemic exposure. So, for example, there was a study using the dapivirine ring in lactating women, and you do get low exposure in breast milk. And you do get, of course, pl detectable plasma concentrations of tenofovir following a non-systemic administration. And finally, the impact of topical methods on mucosa. This shouldn't be surprising. We learned from nanoxanol 9, a topical microbicide. There's a lot in the lubricant research field showing how important things like osmolality of delivery methods are. And in terms of long-acting treatment, there's definitely a kind of journey moving from the short-acting injections, longer-acting, and hopefully moving up to implants. But I'm going to finish on a suggestion that perhaps we're going in the wrong direction for PrEP. And maybe we need to be thinking about actually moving towards short-acting dual function, topical PrEP, as opposed to long-acting. Why? I think for some people, I'm thinking particularly of high-risk men who have sex with men, Short-acting PrEP may be preferable because we know from oral PrEP studies risk is not continuous and event-based methods may limit toxicity and short-acting methods may limit resistance. And perhaps linking PrEP with higher risk sexual practices either by including PrEP in lubricants or including PrEP in rectal douches. So we know that men who report receptive anal sex, most of them have douched before, and a very high proportion would report being likely to use a PrEP containing douche prior to anal sex. So a PrEP that's dissolvable in tap water with a rapid onset of action to be used immediately prior to receptive anal sex, I think could be ideal. Is it a dream? No, it's not. There's a study called Dream, development of rectal enema as a microbicide. There's some animal studies showing efficacy, and there is some work going on. But again, very high levels of acceptability and good pharmacokinetics from giving tenofovir as a douche prior to receptive anal sex. So my dream future to finish. Firstly, I think really focusing on non-treatment agents. We've touched on the risks of resistance with rilpivirine and cabotegravir. And for example, there is a vaginal ring delivery under study looking at a CCR5 inhibitor. But really, I think the goal is intelligent implants. And I think drug release, ideally adjusted to plasma concentrations, which the implant will monitor as well. But that option for immediate shutdown without removal by microchip and individualized concomitant medication, an implant that provides depot contraception or even STI treatment based on inbuilt RPR monitoring for syphilis. That is my real dream. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much for your kind attention.